Hear now the word of God from Acts chapter 11, verses 1 and 19 through 23, as word of the gospel spreads throughout the nations. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, today is a day of Thanksgiving, and um, I actually try to stay up on uh, that piece of gratitude piece in our own ministry, uh, and I like to write thank you notes, and uh, this week's been a little busy, and I haven't had time to get all those done, so I, if you would humor me for just a second, I know Jimmy Fallon can do this on a TV show, I figured we could do this in worship and uh, get a few of those notes written before, uh, before the, uh, you know, the sermon, uh, I even thought maybe we could use the music if we could time that. Maybe we could just kind of set a little mood here and, uh, and say thank you to, for some things. Kind of get in the spirit, all right? You, you want to try that? Yeah, you're like, I'm not sure. Let's, let's go anyway. All right. We had a, there it is. All right. Thank you, Broadway, for 11 and a half years of ministry with you, for sharing in the highest... Uh, moments of your lives and walking with you in some of the toughest and for most of all laughing at my jokes when they're not funny <laughs> all right we got four more chances guys here we go all right <laughs> thank you thank you Broadway for being a place where bald is beautiful or at least one of the basic requirements for being your pastor <laughs> got three more chances Thank you. <laughs> How about now? That's what we get for laughing and clapping. That's right. <laughs> All right. How about now? Hello. <laughs> starting, starting to take this uh, personally. It may be that all of the mics are out, which is that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to do it without the music or with it, either way. Thank you, Broadway, for celebrating 110 years, 110 years of ministry in 2018. And for the 59th year of coming to a church named Broadway that isn't actually on Broadway. All right, we better quit while we're ahead. Let's give some celebration to God's work here at Broadway and for the mics working again. And of course, Pastor Lewis is not fired, but the day is young. <laughs> Today, we simply come to remember some things, to be reminded of some things that we might otherwise forget. There's a poet that has said, either I am a nobody or I'm a nation. Either I'm a nobody or I'm a nation. Today, we are reminded that on, on God's side of things, uh, we are a nation. 
In fact, that God's MO is to gather up the nobodies of the world and make a nation out of them. And here we sit. We are what God has been wanting all along. And you probably don't wake up thinking that way. You don't probably come to church, you know, most of us are trying, this is just a human thing, we're getting where we need to be, we're getting the kids, you know, you know we hope that they get to church with clothes on, we, you know, we hope there's goldfish, we hope we can get, you know, things worked out, you know, we, we're getting through life, we're doing the best that we can, but that being the case does not minimize in any way the truth that God is making us his people, And that we are the very thing God has wanted all along. Ordinary people formed into the people of God. We're the thing God's wanted all along and not someone else. There's not someone better. There's not somebody else coming along after us that is going to be better at this than we are. It's not something that happens someplace else, you know, in a more strategic spot. This is not something that happens in a better time when things seem to be working out okay. In fact, most consistently, God's people are crystallized as God's people in difficult times when, when it's clear that they're needed. We are, you, me, us, we are what God has been wanting all along. All the way back to a nomadic goat herder and his wife, Abraham and Sarah, who God said, I'm calling you to be a great people even though you don't have any children. And I'm going to bless the world. Nations will be blessed through you. Nobodies into nations. To a man named Moses who was an exiled prince out again in the fields tending to sheep. And God spoke to him and gave him a call, a mandate, a mission to call the people back out of slavery and into this identity. Slave people who are treasured people, nobodies into nations. And in Exodus 19, we find this beautiful description of how this works. God says, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God's plan is nation. This is God's MO. This is God's pattern. God gathers up nobodies and turns them into nations, into treasured possessions, into priestly nation, meaning a, a, a go-between, an earthly go-between between the realities of heaven and the realities of earth. This is us connecting heaven and earth in our own bodies, in our own lives, setting us apart for the high status of service. We are what God has wanted all along. When Jesus, God's son, walked to the earth, what did he do? He gathered up ordinary people, fishermen and tax collectors and sinners, and he spent time with them, extended the boundaries of that grace so that the people on the outside could become the people on the inside. And that those people who had not been accepted, the people who were sick, the people who had leprosy, the people who were blind, the people who were poor, the people who had been unwanted, the Samaritan, the Gentile, all brought in, making nations out of nobodies. So it should be no surprise that this is what Jesus intended to do even after he left. Into the hands of these people, he left a mission, a mandate, and a miracle. Greater things will you do than even I have done. Were words he spoke to ordinary people like us. Because he said, my spirit will be poured out unto all flesh, and you will make nations out of nobodies to the end of the earth. And here we sit. Today, the people God has wanted all along. It was in this community of uh, these followers of Jesus after Jesus' death that it all sort of came together. In the book of Acts, we read how the, the church was formed and how something new came onto the face of the earth. And we see how they had uh, come together and how the message of Jesus held them together and how they began to look as a community like Jesus looked while he was on earth. 
And then as the story progresses, what we come to today is the moment when that goes viral. When, when the, 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 the mission of Jesus goes global. And it happens in a way that, you know, on the surface you might not expect. But knowing how Jesus works, it's the very thing that you would expect. It happens in the midst of tragedy. The peace of this, this um, beautiful and young community, this fledgling community of Jesus, the peace was broken when Stephen, in his innocence, is stoned to death. And the disciples, much like after Jesus' crucifixion, scatter. I mean, it's a very difficult time. Little did the persecutors know that they had just unleashed a movement into the world. It's been said that the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. People, as we talked about last week, willing to give their lives couldn't be stopped. The one thing that, that becomes the sort of the final word, death, is no longer the final word. These people were unstoppable. So they were like ski, seeds scattered in the wind. They were like embers of the fire blown out into the world only to start fires other places. Which brings us today to a little place called Antioch. Which we're using as a way of understanding the way God works uh, in the church, not just then, but today. Antioch was a special place. It was 300 miles north of Jerusalem. And what's, I think the thing to maybe note about Antioch that's most important, it was a crossroads uh, for many, uh, many uh, ways within uh, the, the Middle East. And it was, uh, a, it was a, a step removed from the central core of Jerusalem. Jesus himself had said that this would go from Jerusalem to the wider region of Judea and then outside those boundaries to Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. And Antioch was basically the start of this movement toward the ends of the earth. What's remarkable about Antioch is that the people there had never met Jesus. It was the second generation. It was a step removed from the, 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 the uh, epicenter of Jesus. It was a step removed from the apostles who had spent time with Jesus and heard directly from Jesus and had get, been given power from Jesus. It was a step removed. You had Paul there who had met Jesus on the Damascus Road, the resurrected Christ, and it had changed his life. But other than that, no one there in Antioch had seen Jesus at all, had not met him face to face, and yet the DNA carried. The message, the mission, the, the look and feel of Jesus was now embodied in these people. In fact, you could look around and you could see the things that Jesus did happening among them. There was a unity there were people coming together who otherwise would never have been together. There was a depth of love and sacrifice and service, a fearlessness in the face of persecution. It looked a lot like Jesus. And so there in Antioch, God had what he had been wanting all along. A people gathered up from all the people of the earth. And it is here that this movement is first called Christian. They, the people who had never met Jesus, were little Christs. Their identity and their actions looking a lot like Jesus. Here's the beautiful thing. If it could happen there, it could happen anywhere. 300 miles from Jerusalem in the years after Jesus' death, or thousands of miles away, any place on the planet, anywhere any time with people who, who simply look like Jesus looked and act like Jesus acted and who might also be called Christians. Little reminders of Jesus. The church in Jerusalem got wind of it, and this is the scripture we read today. They got wind of that, and they sent Barnabas, uh, who, uh, whose name means son of encouragement. They uh, sent Barnabas to go check it out. And when he gets there, he sees it. He sort of verifies and witnesses the fact that God's clearly at work, even among the Gentiles, even among people who had not been wanted or people even considered to be evil at a time. And now they're in the center of it. And as they tell the story of Jesus to the Gentiles, it's clear that God's at work. In fact, his, his statement is it's clear that God's hand was on them. 
which is an indicator of, of what he saw. It was like they realized that telling the story of Jesus to everybody was something Jesus himself would have done. That the way they were caring for one another was something Jesus himself would do. The ways that barriers and obstacles between people were being removed, that was something Jesus would do. And the fearlessness and the commitment of the people demonstrated in the face of persecution sounded a lot like Jesus. Several years ago, in fact, over 100 years ago, a book came out in, the, in his steps and it, it introduced an idea into the world that took popularity maybe in the last 20 years. Uh, the question, what would Jesus do? And uh, In His Steps is like this uh, spiritual classic. It's a fictional account of a community of people who, if they ask that question and live by it, what would Jesus do? It changed their lives. And then that became sort of a pop Christianity kind of thing, and we got bracelets, and there were T-shirts made. Did anybody ever have a WWJD bracelet? I'm just curious. How many of us had one of those? And um, I remember reading that book probably 25 years ago and thinking it was pretty powerful, but then as that pop Christianity thing came, it was like somehow maybe it lost some of its uh, juice. I don't know. And I've wrestled with it over the years. Like, you know, one of the things that we do is we maybe should ask, what would Jesus do in every situation, which was, I think, the original intent. But, you know, the way we tend to do it is we ask, what would Jesus do when we get into trouble, right? And then maybe more specifically, it's hard to know exactly, well, what, if, what would Jesus do here? Like, that seems like one thing, and I'm probably not going to get it right, right? What would Jesus do? I don't know. So you, it's a very specific sounding thing, and that seems a little bit overwhelming. Uh, I actually saw a meme that helped me get at some of my angst about this. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's the bracelet, and it says uh, at the top, what would Jesus do? And what we say, and probably more accurate is J-W-P-N-H-G-H-I-T-S-I-T. FP, which is Jesus probably wouldn't have gotten himself into this in the first place. Because he's Jesus, right? So if we don't understand what we're saying about what we see in Antioch, uh, this, this might clarify it for us. Because it, there were specific things that were happening. But if you take a step back from this community, what we might say is that we would ask the question, what kinds of things would Jesus do? What kinds of things would you see if Jesus was a part of it, if the Spirit of God was involved in it? I think that helps. It takes it from like this one thing that we either are going to get right or wrong into this more fluid and organic thing that happens when the Holy Spirit gets among people. That's a better, that's a, a, a better I think, description of what I see in the body of Christ among ordinary people like us who specifically will get it wrong all kinds of times, right? If we have the expectation that we're going to get the one thing right that Jesus would do in every circumstance as because we're God's people, that is setting us up for failure. That is an unrealistic expectation. And I think it trips us up some. But if you take a step back and look at the church at Antioch or the look at the church at, at, at Broadway, the hope would be that people would look from the outside and say, yeah, that kind of looks like Jesus. Not perfectly, but it's the kind of thing Jesus would do. And it's the kinds of stuff that Jesus would care about. In his care for the widow and the orphan and the stranger. In his call to value children. In his call to service. In a call to generosity. In a call to people who are willing to offer themselves again and again to the, the transforming process of the Spirit. And who are willing to take risks often risk for the outsider at the expense of the insider, which is a very hard thing to do within a community of people. It's not, it goes against our sociology to care as much about or more about the outsider than we do the insider. To be willing to put ourselves up on the offering, uh, uh, the table, basically, the altar, to offer ourselves, as Paul says, as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. That's what worship means, Paul says. To offer ourselves again and again. And the problem with a living sacrifice is that it keeps crawling off the altar. You've got to keep going back and going back and offering yourself uh, to God. But those are the kinds of things Jesus would do. And the results aren't always a given. There isn't always success. But you can look back at some things and say clearly God was at work there. And those are the kinds of things we want to lean into. So today we want to tell a few of those stories. Um, they're, not, they're sort of representative, just a little bit uh, from here, different various places that help remind us that these are the kinds of things that Jesus would do. 
and are examples of how we're trying to follow the Spirit in our ministry. I'm going to invite Pastor Lewis back up, if he can behave himself, and we're going to talk about a new ministry that begins here in a couple weeks that comes out of our, these steps we've been taking in the use of technology. I am not a tech guy. Lewis is. This is why the body of Christ is important, because um, I call him to help me program you know, my VCR or whatever they call them, those, those newfangled things these days. And, um, and yet, we want to be high-tech and high-touch is the way it's been described. We want to use technology to aid relationship. And what we're seeing in the use of our uh, online services is that it helps us connect to people who are not in the room. It helps families have discussions. Some families will not be able to come to church, and they'll sit down, and they'll watch the sermon and have a discussion, which is pretty remarkable. There are people who will go and binge watch the sermons so that they can catch up, which is just this whole new thing. Uh, there are people who are watching our, uh, our services ahead of coming to church so they, they know, are, are, is this a welcoming place? Will I fit in here? And then uh, Pastor Lewis wants to tell us about another extension of how we're going to use technology to, um, to connect to some of our people. And um, as you can tell, he's, he's excited about it. Just a little. Um, have you ever had your inner monologue turn into an outer dialogue? That's what happened to me just a minute ago. Um, <clears throat> Two years ago, we should have left it alone. You should have just, you should have just moved just on. Just left it alone. <sighs> Again, inner outer. Two years ago, we started streaming this service uh, to Facebook. We started very small by putting one of our phones up in the booth and pointing it at the stage and and streaming this service uh, to Facebook, and that very quickly became a place where people who couldn't get here on Sunday would show up and would be able to get connected here, whether it was for the first time, if, if, if folks were just kind of trying to test us out and see who we were, or if it was for someone who had been here for, for a long time and they just couldn't think about the fact that they were going to miss their church family on a Sunday morning. So they started watching on Facebook, and that kind of grew and grew. And we uh, entered into a relationship with a streaming company that was going to help us take that kind of to the next level and allow us to use the cameras and the switchers and the sound boards and all of that stuff and, and put out a really quality video stream uh, that would go to Facebook and to our website. And so we got really excited about that. Fast forward to about eight months ago, I got a phone call from a friend of mine who had gotten an Amazon Fire Stick for Christmas and a subscription to Netflix. And she couldn't really, didn't really understand what to do with it. So she said, can you come help? I said, of course, I'm the tech guy, I can handle that. I'd never seen an Amazon Fire Stick before. I had no idea what I was looking for. I thought maybe come in there and be this you know, big thing that goes on the side of the TV. This is an Amazon Fire Stick, okay? It is basically a little key that goes into the side of your television into the, to an HDMI and then allows you to stream things like Netflix, um, movies that Amazon has if you have Amazon Prime. It allows you to stream things like that um, directly to your TV through the internet. Thought that was kind of cool. Didn't really think a whole lot more about it until I was having a conversation with a, with a good friend of mine, Scott, and we were talking about how this little Amazon device that his mother had gotten had changed her world by her ability to be able to communicate through that, be able to, to, to reach out to friends, to see videos, to see things that she wouldn't normally get to see. Uh, a week later, our streaming company said, hey, we've got this new thing we'd like to, to offer you as part of what we do with you and how we partner with you. We want to build you an Amazon Fire Stick channel so that now, every Sunday morning, we can stream to Amazon Fire Sticks in people's homes, okay? That's not where it gets exciting for me. We can do that, you can pick up your computer and have that. This is where it gets exciting for me. I come from a big Italian family, and when we all get together and somebody's not there, we notice and we miss them. Same goes for our church family. So I talked to Pastor Joe, and we, we worked out a list of our folks that can't get here anymore because of one reason or another, whether it's because they can't get out, because they can't drive, because they can't, uh, they don't have anybody to bring them, or they're just too sick. And uh, 
we got together and we have worked out, we are going to start taking these into their homes for them and setting them up and showing them how to use them. And here's the be- one of the beauties of this is for, for what we're doing. You can take the remote. We can't do it in here. But you can take the remote. You can push this little microphone button. And you can say, open Broadway UMC into the remote. And it opens our channel, which looks something like this. It takes you right to our channel, and it starts playing church. Our folks know they want to be with their family, with their church family. And through this, we get to say, your church family wants to be with you too. We want you to know that we still love you, that we still think about you, and we still want you to feel like you are an everyday part of this church family here at Broadway. This is how we're going to do it. And it's because of your giving that we get to do this. So thank you very much. Thanks, Lewis, for that. As you can imagine, in a church like Broadway, there are about 40 or 50 people that used to come here who can't come anymore. And uh, it just is a, it's really exciting to think that we can love and care for them in the way that we want to. And technology is going to help us do that. Pastor Lars is here uh, to continue to cast a vision for how we use our, minis- our space, especially, uh, to, uh, to serve. And uh, there will be some pictures on the screen to remind us of the kinds of things that Jesus would do that happen among us. And Laura's going to update us about how we're using our space and how we're looking at our space uh, to continue to serve in ministry. You know, um, throughout Jesus' ministry, he would meet people who, who wondered if their life had any value, who questioned whether or not they were worthy to be a part of God's family, people who who were pretty sure that they had no hope, no hope for healing, no hope for forgiveness, no hope for being included and accepted and loved. But when these people encountered Jesus, they discovered that in his presence, they belonged. Here at Broadway, we desire to be a unique people and place where people from our community can come here and experience that very same thing. Every time someone walks through our doors, our prayer is that they would encounter Jesus Christ himself and that they would know that they are welcome and that they can find the hope and the healing that they long for because they belong. Um, Here, this building that we are sitting in This campus that we call our Melrose campus, it is a tool that helps us to do that. It is a tool that we use to help people discover and and receive the invitation to become fully alive through a relationship with Jesus Christ. As people come in and um, they participate in worship services like this one, as they come in and are part of fellowship events, as they, they come in and grow through small groups and step studies as they serve through our various ministries. We've known for quite some time that we needed to create more space so that we can invite even more people to encounter Christ in this place. And so over the past couple of years, we've been talking with you, with the people in our congregation to discern together what our greatest needs are. As we've talked together, we've recognized that that we have a great need to create more space for our growing youth ministry as well as additional classrooms for our children and our adults. Uh, We've recognized that that in order to be the most welcoming place in our community, we really need to improve our parking and our welcome spaces and our worship spaces, as well as um, create adequate space for our our offices, for our staff. And so um, we have been working this past year to develop a master plan that will address all of these needs. Uh, We presented a draft of that plan to many different groups in our congregation this past summer and fall, and now we are still hard at work um, adapting and and refining that plan in light of what we have heard. We're we're taking our time doing this uh, because we want to ensure that this plan allows us to continue to invite people to encounter Christ for many years to come here in this space. 
And we also want to ensure that um, these needs that we have are addressed in a very timely and cost-effective way that will allow our ministry to grow across the board, you know, especially in the first phase of this project. We want to make sure that we can do more than just address one specific need, but that we can create space um, to grow throughout our ministry. And so this morning, let me invite you to continue to be praying for our des design team as we continue to discern how best to do this. And uh, let me um, invite you to, to just be looking forward in great anticipation and expectation to the new year when we hope to have a floor plan to present to you. All right. Thanks, Laura. Let's thank her for being here. And uh, finally, I want to show some pictures of the kinds of things that we think Jesus would be doing outside of our walls as we work with different groups in our community. And as we're finding our role at Broadway as uh, a way of bringing lots of folks together and in our strategic partners being uh, a sort of a convener. Somebody has uh, said several years ago that the ministry of the church is often to bring people together who just normally wouldn't get together and then talk about new and exciting things that could happen. And so you see some pictures from our partnership with Hotel Inc. as we work with people around um, issues of uh, having enough food or having a place to, to sleep. So our ministry, one-on-one -on -one with homeless people. You see our, our, some pictures of our ministry with the Foundry, the beautiful children in the west end of our city who we have a dream of raising up as leaders for our community working from the earliest ages in their lives to give them a different kind of start in life and to support parents who want to offer that kind of hope and that possibility to their children, just like we would to any of our children. And we are excited about the beautiful things that are happening there at the Foundry. That same work extending then to other parts of the world in our partnership with Ashley and Justin Guest in Honduras, so we're sort of calling it the Foundry South as they start a new work in Roatan, and as they work with the beautiful Guardifana people there, uh, that we are able to see what God might do, what Jesus would want to do in those communities, knowing that we're probably going to learn a lot more than they are, and we're going to gain so much that we need by learning from them and then serving them. Our ministry with uh, survivors of human trafficking has opened our eyes to a whole world friends that we did not know existed and the opportunity to be in some of the messiest of ministry in some of the hardest of situations seems to be the kind of thing that Jesus would be doing I think Jesus would also just take one person and pair them up with another person in a loving relationship just over lunch like our mentors do in schools and our partnerships with schools allow us to do and for, for the many of us who say yes to that just one-on-one -on -one kind of thing, the beautiful ministries that are happening. Another thing that I think is really important these days is for us to be people who listen. And we have been learning that the church can listen to the community and hear things that other people don't hear. That we actually can be the kind of folks who, uh, who take that listening as a spiritual practice. So we did some dialogue sessions uh, and um, began working with uh, the Housing Authority of Bowling Green. And I'm going to get to these pictures a little bit later, guys. These are uh, Faith UMC pictures. We'll come back to those. Uh, the Housing Authority of Bowling Green, we brought Abraham Williams here to some dialogue sessions we were doing as a church, and we asked him simply the question as he was standing here or sitting here on, on the stage in front of a group of us, what does the community need? And he, whatever he said, we thought, well, we'll just try to be responsive. And he said, we need a grocery store. And we need a place for people to have access to food. So we began a conversation that brought in several other partners, uh, the, the, city, the county government and Western Kentucky University and some MBA students and other churches and several of our folks with different gifts and the uh, conservation district and the farmer's market. And we began to look at ways that we could do that. We couldn't find a spot. We couldn't find a space. We were worried about how expensive it would be. And finally, so, you know, along the way, somebody said, what if we didn't ask them to come to get groceries because that's the trouble. They don't have transportation. They can't buy affordable food. Why don't we go to them? And so the mobile market, the mo mobile grocery idea was born. And then Warren County Schools donated a bus for us to do this. And one of our people who's an organizer is helping organize the bus. And our, we have a lawyer who uh, not only reads scripture but also can draft up the papers. 
Uh, thanks, Chris. And uh, we have somebody who, in our church who did the logo, and somebody is doing the community mapping so that we know where we need to go, and another church is coming in to paint the bus, and, uh, and it's just this beautiful kind of thing, and we're just trying to do the kinds of things Jesus would do. The other is those pictures from Faith UMC. I want to bring those back up. Because uh, about four years ago, we began working with Faith United Methodist Church to determine what their next steps were. Uh, and they were facing many struggles that are not unlike many other Methodist churches and many other churches, period. One of the things that we might be prone to forget here at Broadway is how special we have it, how, how fortunate we are. And we have the gift of some, some leadership that put us on a path years ago that has, we've been able to steadily walk uh, for, for years. And not every church has that. And some, some, some things in the past have held Faith UMC up. A beautiful thing happened. The annual conference said, hey, we'll help. And if Broadway will help and the people of Faith will help, we'll do a three-year partnership. We'll find a leader and we'll see if we can get this ministry on a different path. And it worked out. And Pastor Cam came. And then these, uh, these African refugees started coming, and I'll tell you kind of how that happened here in a second. But they went from five kids to 40 kids, and 35 of them are from Africa. And then all these uh, people like us are figuring, like, how do we, <laughs> you know, they had to teach them not to turn the light off in the sanctuary during church because, they, you know, they'd grown up in refugee camps, and yet these beautiful children had been placed in their hands. And this ministry has, has grown. Now two and a half years in, the, the situation has turned around in many ways. But in some ways, some of those legacies that, that have held them back in the past are still there. So the people of faith have come to us, and, and we're in conversation with them about what's next. And they are discerning whether they were, were, would be open to becoming a multi-site campus of Broadway, much like our Greenwood campus 10 years ago. And we're in the process of talking uh, the, the, on our side of things if that is something that we feel called to do. And we don't know. And in some ways, I would be reluctant to even bring that up, except that we're going to be talking to them. Some of our leaders are going over in December. Uh, and in the next year, we're going to discern together whether that's the next step for them and for us. And it seems like the kind of thing Jesus would do, but there are a lot of details. And so we need our prayers to, to continue to say, is this where God is leading us? Most importantly, how does the beautiful ministry that happens at faith continue to happen? Let me tell you the story why I think it's important. It reminds us of the world that we live in and, and the, the influence of even a place like Bowling Green. But um, there was a family that came to Faith UMC, and as the Pastor Cam got to know them, um, we heard their story. Essentially, they were separated in Africa. Father, children in different places in different refugee camps. The goal was to be safe and then to get to the United States. So in this, like, last conversation with his family, this father sits down with his children. He says, when you get to the United States, everybody look over here to this side of the room, find the cross and flame, and they will help you. It would be my hope that anybody in the world, anywhere in the world, would be able to say that. That the things that Jesus would do would be so clearly identified with our ministry that anybody could say that and it would be true. Well, we can't, we can't influence the whole world, but we can influence the world through our spot here. And so we pray that this would be the case, that people in our community, people around us would know that when, when you see the cross and flame or when you hear Broadway, what you mean is that Jesus is at work among these people. And so we're going to offer ourselves to that. That's, that's what Consecration Sunday is about. We come with a reminder that it absolutely matters that we do. Understanding that our ministry is not a given. If you, if you think, does it matter or not, it matters. For those of us who steward this ministry every day, who steward our finances every day, who try to find the right next thing to do, it absolutely matters. This is a time to lean into our, our ministry. And we appreciate so much those of you who are doing that. And we do that today through the giving of our, our pledge for the year ahead and for offering ourselves as living sacrifices, as we have said, as we come to communion. So as you prepare those cards and as uh, those who are preparing to serve come forward, let's prepare ourselves to be the body of Christ, to recognize that we are in fact the body of Christ as we join in uh, 
this communion together. We remember that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, take, drink. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink it, remember me. And so we do. We remember Jesus. We remember what Jesus has called us to do. We remember the sacrifice of God's love for us as we come and receive the bread and the cup. As I said earlier, everyone is welcome. You don't have to be a member of our church or of any church to come. We come and we come down the left side of the aisle and come up to the front. Today, all of the stations will be in the front. There'll be three across and then one over here where the the youth will come in and then a gluten-free station right here at this corner if you require those elements. I invite you to take a piece of the bread and break it off of the loaf, dip it into the cup and receive it as a way of receiving the gift of grace of Jesus in your own life and as a way of uniting you in the body of Christ, that we remember that God makes us one with him, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, and that we will be in that together until Jesus comes again, or until we feast together with him in the heavenly banquet that takes this meal to a whole other level. Reminding ourselves that we are the people God has wanted all along, not someone else, not somebody better, but you, me, us, the people of God, empowered by the Spirit of God in us, doing the things that Jesus himself would have done. Would you come? Would you bring your gifts? Would you bring your pledges and bring yourselves to this holy mystery as you come?